<laughs> we'll call the uh, meeting of the Deerfield School Committee on Tuesday, September 14th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. to order. I should note that this meeting is a virtual meeting. It is being recorded. So for those in attendance, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and <clears throat> we first order of business is to review and approve the minutes of June 8th, 2021. I would accept a motion if anyone cares to make one. I think Carrie's can't hear. Carrie, did you make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. I can't. Carrie is speaking, but I'm trying to see. Hmm. Something weirds. She's I'm not trying to remotely mute it. <laughs> it doesn't indicate it's muted. No, it doesn't. <clears throat> um, it would show up. No. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. I have a motion, Carrie, if you're second, and could you raise your hand? <laughs> okay. Do we have any comments on the minutes as they were written or I'm not seeing any so I will assume we're moving to a vote roll call vote <clears throat> uh, Ken Cutterback yes David Sharp yes Carrie Etchells yes hey there she is hey and <laughs> Erica Jacob <laughs> yes yes and I do not see Mary up oh, Mary in attendance yet, so um, we will call it four to nothing. Fin financial statement. Shelly. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome Hi, back. Hi, Shelly. Good to see you all. Uh, so I did send out uh, the financial statements and the narrative report. I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can through this. Won't go through everything since you have it on paper, but feel free to ask questions. Uh, so since the last meeting, which would be uh, over the summer months, uh, warrants were still signed electronically. They were for FY21 and FY22. There were 44 warrants signed totaling $402,167.68. Uh, we are closed. Our general fund is closed with the town of Deerfield, and we're working on reconciling our revolving funds with the town ledger. Uh, the school books get recorded primarily for bookkeeping purposes on our end, and then the town maintains the official record. So we like to make sure that all of our accounts are balanced before they close out their end of year. Um, but with our general fund, uh, the budget did have a balance of about 194000 almost remaining. Um, we talked about this a lot last year. We took a conservative approach to purchasing. Uh, we had several mid-year personnel changes or position vacancies. And then we had direct budget savings and accounts such as transportation that would normally be fully spent. So that on top of the grant funding that we were receiving for COVID relief uh, allowed us to free up some funds in the budget. So we reclassified some expenditures and moved that money to school choice for future use. Does anyone have questions about that before I go on to FY22? Uh, I got a quick question. Um, actually, it's partly based on the narrative you sent out and, and the discussion of that 193000 Is that, when you say it was put back in school choice, is that represented on the numbers you have here for school choice? Yes, it should be. So, because so, fiscal year 21 start of the year is last year's budget, right? Correct. Okay, so and I guess I'm just not seeing that 193 back into the into the school choice total for next year. Am I? Uh, well, let me double check on the numbers, and then I can circle back. Unless it, because I'm assuming we had more revenue than uh, a hundred thousand. 
So where you see it reflected is that our expenses are lower. So the expenses came in at $191,274. They were projected to be $195,000 more than that. So what we did is we moved those expenditures over to the general fund. So it increased our end of year bottom line. So the bottom line, if we had spent all of the school choice budget, would have yeah. been 193000 less than what I've sh I'm showing you here of the 1.2. Okay. I guess I'm not quite getting it. Um, so it's not, uh, the 193 wasn't put back at the end of the year into the school choice funds. Well, so it was. So we had originally budgeted 193000 more in expenditures. And so I moved though in school choice expenditures. So because we had general funds available, I reclassified those expenses over to the general fund. So the expenses went down. So the end of year balance is higher. Okay, okay. So the, <clears throat> okay. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. in other words, the expenses that you're showing for 191,000, um, would have been a lot higher had you not taken the Correct. general fund and put it there. Correct. Okay. Okay. It would have been close to 400000 Right. Okay. Got it. Yep. Got it. I was just, okay, that makes sense. Then when I'm reading those charts that you put together, I was looking for that 193 coming back in. But I, I got it. I got it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that clarifying question. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so I, Ken, do you have another question before I keep going? Um, well, just the the question I guess I would ask is: as you um, have expenses anticipated of five hundred nine thousand dollars, as long as we're on the school choice or focused on it, yep. do the two new positions are they included in that? Um, they're not included in that. They because right now we have some general funds available okay. because of other position vacancies. So the okay, five hundred and nine thousand, um, we had regular budget, you know, salaries right. for IAs and teachers and those pieces. Then we have the hundred and twenty thousand for out of district placement that we budgeted mm -hmm. last year. We have another fifty thousand that we added to cover the budget reduction that we did on town meeting floor. Mm -hmm. And then we're overspending our revenue by about forty five thousand. So, right. you know, if we were to back out those pieces. Our expenses would probably be around 340 or so instead of the 510 that we're almost at. Okay. Um, and I think that we're going to be okay with the new positions being covered from budget. Like I said, there's been some, there's still some vacancies. So that's freeing up some funds or new hires have come in at different steps than previous people. Um, so that always frees some things up. Plus, um, we are going to have some savings in transportation as well because we're down a bus right now, um, which was also in my report that I sent to you. So I think we're gonna be okay with general fund right now. Okay, thank you. New, sure. Now you make it back to your okay. report. <laughs> so we, we sort of just talked about some of this stuff. Um, I did share out the general fund and school choice expense reports. The general fund is pretty boring at this point. You shouldn't really see a whole lot of negatives. Um, I think maybe there's one account that's over the school um, liability insurance, you know, the building insurance that came in a little bit high. So that's an overage there. But again, not concerned. Um, the school choice report does have some negative accounts on there. Uh, one thing in particular was we received the arts partnership bill um, after June 30th. So we couldn't use um, last year's funds because we had rolled the book. So it looks like that account is going to be over. So the 1950 that shows there, that was actually part of last year's $5,000 budget. Um, and then we had some central office billing that took place prior to or after, I'm sorry, the town closed their book. So the town asked, gives us a deadline and says, submit all of your bills. Um, Frontier had not been done processing its bills at that point. So we had to pay some central office expenses out of school choice. So if you look at that school choice report, you'll see some zeros in the budget column. That's because those are those June bills that didn't get on the encumbrance list for the town. 
Um, otherwise, you know, things are pretty status quo and, and on par. Um, other than the couple of things that we just talked about, there are two new positions. We have a part-time um, nurse that started that was not an anticipated expense. It's 20 hours a week. Um, and that is specific to meet a student's needs. And then we have, um, oops, I don't know what that noise was. That was, I'm sorry, it was something in my end and I didn't mute. <laughs> well, it's it me. A dog, so you never know. Um, <clears throat> we have the need for an IA in the early childhood program to help cover staffing and student needs in there. So that is an extra expense. Again, we have some budget savings to cover it, and then early childhood is back up to typical revenue and capacity, so I think we're gonna be okay there with covering that position. Um, Tina and myself and Amy, the early childhood director, and Karen, the special education director, have already talked about this being a one-year position and that if another IA is needed, that'll have to be had during the budget discussion because it would obviously increase our budget, but at this point, um, we'd be looking just for this one year. And then uh, I am in conversation with Karen, our special education director about out of district placements. Um, there is some movement happening here and we may need some additional funds above the 120,000 that we have budgeted. But fortunately, we do have a good school choice surplus that if we need to dip into, we can. We also have some special education revolving funds still available, even though there's no revenue coming in and there's no expenses going out of the SPED department. Um, that, that fund, because we don't have a tuition in student any longer, we still have about, I think, 50000 uh, I think was what was in my report, uh, 40 or 50. Um, available for you. So if we needed to tap into that, we certainly could. Uh, so those were the three concerns that I wanted to bring to your attention. I'm happy to take other questions about them if you have them. Um, and I did also mention in my report a couple of you know, business office kind of things that are happening just to keep you in the loop is that we are looking to get payroll into our database. Currently, payroll is done through Excel, and then we forward everything off to the town because the town does the official paying of school employees. Um, but we want to change that so that we have more real-time data. So instead of doing an Excel, we will do in our database, which is already capable of it. We have the module. We just have never used it for the elementary schools. Um, so it'll make our, our budgets and our reports in more real-time and then also give us information such as hire date, column and step, et cetera, because right now those are in paper files. So, you know, if I'm filling out something that requires somebody's hire date for proof of employment, I actually have to physically go pull their paper file. So it's just not efficient. So we're trying to increase efficiency there. Um, and similarly, school lunch has not been officially recorded in the school's database. We've done all of our calculations, you know, sort of old bookkeeping style in Excel. Um, so I'm looking to get that online so that we have more real-time data and that there's better systems of checks and balances. So those are just some other things we're working on. Um, overall, you know, despite, you know, a couple of unknowns right now, I think uh, the school is in good financial shape. Um, our revolving funds are anticipated to have the balances that we will need to support expenditures going back onto those funds next year. Um, early childhood, for example, we are using the ESSER grant to pay for quite a bit of our early childhood salaries and wages. Um, and the intention with that was that we could build that account back up to be able to put those salaries back on next year. So that is the plan right now. And I think we're on the right trajectory to do that. So obviously more to be discussed um, as time goes on and once we get into budget season. But right now, I think we're looking pretty good for this school year. Any other questions? I don't have any. Thank you for, uh, as always, a very detailed report and, uh, you know, good summary for us. Thank you. <clears throat> so... Um, the next item on our agenda would be the public comment. We don't have anyone that had requested to uh, speak this evening. So we will move on to unfinished business. And we'll turn it over to Darius with the COVID update. Hello. Um, so, yeah, the COVID update is that starting with pool testing, we did get pool testing off the ground last week um, and also did it yesterday as well. And happy to say that Deerfield's been clean in both pool testings. 
and we're increasing our signups each day. Um, I will have to say that we are, I have to send a lot of thank yous out because we did force a square peg in a round hole. Our vendor has not been, has been behind apparently statewide. A lot of our the districts in the area have not been able to get their pool testing up or their test and stay programs in place because of the, the vendor it can't reach capacity. They didn't send us help. Um, as they promised, they were going to send people to our buildings to help us with the pool testing and such. And so instead that fell upon Tina and the, the nurses, obviously, Tina and then some other volunteers um, who made the pool testing happen. And it kind of, that happened across our district. But um, I think it was important that we got it going. Um, you know, we did, just so people know out there, we did have positive pools in other schools, um, but not at, at Deerfield. So it's, it's great to get that off the ground to keep a, a screen of how we're how we're how we're doing there. Um, in the report I sent out has the um, current pool testing um, statistics of the district um, as well. Um, last Friday, I went to a, uh, a meeting of superintendents with uh, Commissioner Riley, and he kind of talked a little bit about what he, we could predict in the future. Um, and then I, I asked him straight out. Um, some questions regarding, so first he talked about that he is going to look at masking as a statewide mandate uh, again on October 1st. Um, and one go many, a couple of directions. One, he would continue the masking, um, masking as um, prescribed right now, or he may have a way to unmask if you reach certain quotas in your, in your community from vaccination. When I say community, it's school community vaccination and looking mostly at secondary, I think here, vaccination of students, vaccination of staff, number of people in pool testing, and then overall percentage in your community as well. They're putting together all this type of guidance. So I then asked them kind of a very pointed question on, so does this mean we get to do August all over again and have our internal fights in our community about what we should be doing regarding masks? And he said basically, and it made sense, even though I was almost rude in the way I asked him, I apologize publicly to him, um, that <laughs> that basically it's easy to put in rules, it's hard to take them away. And when's the time that it takes things away is a lot harder than putting in. And we are a state of local control of education, so it is going to fall back on the local control, whether it's in October, November, or whenever we end up doing it, eventually it's gonna fall into your hands to make a decision about you know, how we change our, our, our COVID protocols. Right now we are following, we got into that double, I'm saying it's kind of all, because everybody kind of understands is a clear understanding where we stand. If the state said tomorrow that they no longer are recommending masks and they give some other way of doing it, it doesn't change where we stand because our local board of health has a mask mandate and you have a mask policy in place. Both those would have to be rescinded to follow something different or change. Um, so even as October 1 rolls on, we're going to then have to look at it in October, what's going on, have discussions. Um, you know, while the meeting <clears throat> was, was difficult in the sense of size and number of um, uh, leadership positions, uh, you know, number of, between boards of health and school committees, and then you know, obviously, you know, over 250 people. On, um, I'm, I'm open to suggestions of how we make that decision um, moving forward. But it's important, I think, that we move together because we have a union that's together. Um, but you know, the, I was in a meeting earlier today. They said, well, maybe you should have Frontier do it separately because they're going to have a very different, very different. Uh, issues to deal with as they're going to be dealing with vaccinated students rather than unvaccinated students. And it does change um, some of the conversation, depending on what, depending on what you read. Um, so I'm not going to get in that debate, but that was one suggestion that was brought up that would, that would eliminate, eliminate some people and that kind of thing. But um, anyway, that's kind of coming from the commissioner. It's going to come back to us at some point. Um, so that was interesting in this conversation there. Um, and then what else did I have regarding COVID uh, athletics at Frontiers and Plain to you? Yeah, so that's basically my my COVID update. Okay. Regarding COVID and how the school, Tina can also answer how things are going in the building regarding that. Would, would Tina like to do that? <laughs> I can, if you would like. Um, we sure. All right, so um, we're continuing to employ multiple pre the prevention practices that were great success last year, such as encouraging physical, di physical distancing and hand-washing etiquette and masks, 
Um, we went back to our original arrival and dismissal procedures um, in the cafeteria. Students are all facing one direction, but we're eating in the cafeteria now, so that's different. Um, and like Darius said, pool testing and our um, high touch surfaces are being sanitized and cleaned frequently. So we're continuing with all of those um, mitigation strategies. Great. Thank you. And the only other thing I want to follow up, and I know that was a difficult evening, a difficult decision. Some people are still not happy with it. I don't think with people, and I didn't really talk much that evening because there was plenty of talk happening. Um, but the schools themselves, we did a lot of changes at school. And having masks on, I think, was important for those changes. It's not like we went back to what was going on in June and continued masking. You know, we basically changed how we're moving students around, the way they interact in the classroom, the way they interact with the teachers, the way the cafeteria works. So we're taking a little bit of not a little bit, some of June and some of the return to pre-COVID like classroom kind of things. And so there's a lot of moving parts there. And so having that layer of protection, literally, um, um, I think it was very helpful as well. Um, so I just want to put that out there that I don't think the public doesn't see, they think it's, oh, you're just doing June all over again. You're being, no, we actually are implementing a lot, you know, group work and, you know, small group instruction and, you know, other things like that. Um, right, Tina? Yeah, Darius, that was a, actually a really great point because I kind of skimmed over it because we did kind of go back to where we were pre-COVID as far as we're not using two classrooms anymore. Kids are in one classroom. Um, so yeah, we have small group instruction happening. They're transitioning to specials. There's no remote classes. They're eating in the cafeteria. So thanks for reminding me, Darius, that sometimes when we've been in school for like 12 uh, days and it kind of feels like we're right back at it again. So good point. Mm -hmm. Great. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, um, and can, I, can I just ask a question? I'm just curious. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, the you know, it's kind of a blanket policy, the way that the Board of Health has done it around, you know, masks inside. And I'm just curious whether um, there are teachers who may... Um, struggle with it a little bit and, and the reason i'm saying that is you know it's we all were wearing masks right in the pandemic and it was no big deal you know you may bump into somebody a big why and you talk to them for a little bit but just personally i found when we opened the courts up again and i had to go in and actually do a trial with a mask on um i had a really hard time with talking continually um for an extended period of time and you know i feel like i'm fairly fit or whatever but i felt like you know like I, you know, it's just difficult, winded or whatever. And we kind of moved, some of the courts moved to, um, you know, people are masked, but the person who is speaking actually, you know, can take a mask off. Now, granted, there's, you know, certain plexiglass and, and stuff like that. But I just wondered if there are teachers who um, may have sort of felt, uh, suffered the way I did, and um, whether there's, one, if anybody's asked about it, and two, whether there would be a problem um, allowing teachers, if they're at the front of the classroom, to actually not wear a mask if they are, you know, speaking extensively. Obviously, if they go in to a student's desk or something like that and move around the class, they put it back on. But has that been an issue that anybody has asked about as a sort of accommodation, or is it just I'm just a wimp and couldn't handle it? <laughs> well, do you want me to take this one, Darius? <laughs> I mean, I think gonna, there's some good point. There's actually good points there, but yeah, go ahead, Tina. I just didn't know if you wanted me to call David a win. Well, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do think that there's some uncomfort uh, at, at speaking, but don't forget, they're not masked all day long either. There are some mask breaks. We have specials. They have um, lunch and recess, but there is some uncomfort. I think some teachers feel more comfortable wearing the mask as well because we have students in front of them in the classroom. Um, but as to whether or not we are moving towards being able to remove your mask if you're speaking, that falls to Darius <laughs> for the board of health. Yeah, and again, that might be a, a, the next stage because I, I do. I, you know, we're at a was at a conference, right? And so everybody's masked in the room, but the speaker is not. You know what I mean? Because you, you know, it's because it, it does help. So I, I think that it will be something that we can discuss as part of our. I don't know if we do this in stages, rolling back. You know that kind of thing. Um, and then level, you know, teachers also like the model. So I'd like to give teachers actually their feedback on sure. that. How do they feel about it? Yeah. They also like to map model for the students, you know what I mean? And so, um, and they also, they do a lot of outdoor stuff as well. And outdoor yeah. 
speaking and, and, and talking to students there as well. So I think we'll see. I think it was a good point, but we're not mm -hmm. allowing that right now because that's not the rule. David, we have rules. We have yeah. Rules. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Any any other questions for Darius and Tina? Uh, not seeing anybody, so we'll move on to anti-racism and equity subcommittee update. Who do we have this evening? So I don't have any guests tonight. Um, we haven't really had our first kickoff meeting yet. Um, but okay. I, I do want to announce that um, we did hire um, the Radical Empathy Consulting Group. Um, this is the group that worked with Frontier last year, um, and we, we've hired them to come in and help oversee and help us navigate this work through this year. Um, you know, I've got a lot of feedback about you know people you know questioning about you know what's bringing the different parts together, and also you know what is the oversight of this, and where is your the expertise kind of. Um, you know, point there. This group has, you know, again, worked with Frontier, um, and there's several of them. They kind of work together. They meet up. They consult one another, and then they and then they work with the school district. Um, I, am, I was requested someone if we could put, you know, put a bio of who they are and such. I'm getting that information for them. They don't have an active website for those who are looking for it. Um, the Eric group, um, you know, was recommended to us out of UMass. So I'm just excited about that. And then um, they're looking to do a kickoff meeting at the end of this month. We're trying to confirm the date. Even let me get back to me, then I will be sending out a notice to the entire community if new people want to join um, and attend that meeting. But that's looking probably to be the 25th is what we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, that's why I have there. And then from there, we'll have updates from, you know, where, where we're going with the, the work. What, yeah. what was the name again? And then, Erica, you can ask. Yeah. Radical Empathy Consulting Group. Radical Empathy Consulting. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Erica. Just, oh, thank you. Um, I just had a question about, I mean, this sounds really great. And um, I was wondering if you could talk more about how that decision was made to hire them. Like you said, we looked at, you know, who was the, I'm just curious, like who was the we? Was it the anti-racism committee or how did, how did that? Actually, that was about? done administratively. Sarah Mitchell or um, mm -hmm. McCarthy and myself this summer were looking for consultants and looking um, you know, looking at different options. Um, and this is the one that um, basically that a lot of the options weren't available or it was buying into a program and we had already kind of set into a way, um, a direction with the committee. And so I really wanted to find somebody that could pick us up where we are at and then use all the energy and the different, you know, we have different subgroups working, subcommittees working and kind of like help us navigate that moving forward rather than dropping what we did in restarting. So finding that, and it's a high demand right now. Um, every kind of, I think every school district is looking for it. Um, and so um, that was kind of the decision. So no, it came from the administration. Um, I also feel like there was a oh, separation thanks. within the, between the administration and the working group. And I wanted to bring in a party that will help bring that, the two together, because it wasn't, you know, things weren't completely oversight by the administration. It wasn't completely oversight in that. The looseness of that, we started to see, you know, in the last few meetings, we started having, um, you know, I would say we're having, you know, less attendance and it, it kind of felt like we were losing momentum. And I think if we have an outside group um, kind of monitoring us and guiding us, um, that was another kind of key point that um, kind of gave strength behind that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Darius. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. Um, new business, summer building maintenance. So this summer we continued with our, sorry. That's okay. I waited for you to call on me. Oh, no, um, that's fine. <laughs> Don't be shy. With our, <laughs> you know me. <laughs> shy is my middle name. Um, we continue with our flooring replacement. We had four classrooms this year. We typically have three, but we um, replaced four carpets with that vinyl plank flooring. The five, six bathroom um, floors have been updated. We're still awaiting for some partitions. Uh, the custodians have been extremely busy over the summer with some preventative maintenance with the ventilating systems and um, they tested the air exchange, well not them in particularly, but they changed all the filters in the classrooms. 
They've been waxing and washing and shining the building inside and out. They've painted exterior doors and poles and playground with wood chips. And I'll save you all the uh, details, but we're in pretty good shape here. Um, and also we had uh, Catherine Rashad, our talented art teacher that came in and did murals across our main entrance. And so now staff and visitors and students are greeted with color and kindness and positivity with saying such as like every bear belongs here and you are loved. So that's a, a fabulous way for us to kind of straighten it up. Hmm. <laughs> um, and then we have um, on the docket we're trying to get scheduled is all of our entry rugs will be replaced um, coming, coming soon. We just have to get it scheduled. No alarms okay. for that one. So, you know, under the summer building maintenance, um, I wanted to kind of add in. So, you know, obviously we've, we're receiving, you know, more and more heat days, you know, or days that we're kind of pushing the heat limits um, as of either global warming or wherever you believe or why we're having more heat. Um, and I was having a conversation with Trevor, you know, who's now our select board uh, rep. And he wants, we want to talk about creating possibly, um, the, this committee's interested in creating a capital improvement group for the building, looking at air conditioning and bringing it into the building. Um, and maybe putting, looking at doing it like we've been doing the floors, you know, a lot of those air conditioning units are almost the same price as the floor. Um, and, you know, can we do it? Should, how should we do it? How should the town pay for it? Is this something we would do over several years? Do we loans? You know, all the different ways of approaching a product project. And so I wanted to kind of just introduce the thought and see if it gains traction and then I'll have conversations with the select board about creating something similar we did with the Frontier Capital Committee where we create a subgroup with members of the school committee and the members of either select board or select board the representative from you know the finance committee and talk about how we can approach a capital improvement for doing a project like that that could be over a few years. You know, we talk about AC and I you know I just said this joke in the in the Wheatley meeting that um, whether or not you know people agree with you know cooling the buildings, the other issue is that we have moisture in the buildings. You're seeing these mold outbreaks because the amount of humidity that's happening. And so you know you know AC units control moisture in buildings as well. And so that's something that I want people to you know the public that's watching. You're talking about oh you know when I was a kid you know we we had the wood stove during the summer you know what I mean we were fine. You know it's not only about that. It's it's also about you know the, you know keeping the building um, you know you know safe. Um, for molds and, and condition and that kind of stuff. But anyways, uh, my idea is that we create a group to look at this, come up a plan together to present to school. Because I, I have, you know, it's when we work together on them creating those plans, and you get buy-ins from the different boards, it travels a lot smoother. You know, anyway, that's my thought. Okay. Thoughts on my thought? Thank you. I think that's a good thought. <laughs> It would make sense to parcel it out over a couple of years, two or three years. So, um, it would also come down to how they do it. They're, you know, we've had GMROG in; they're looking at it. Um, there's so you have your 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 individual classroom units, and then also you have where I believe what they're looking at in Deerfield is they may have to do units for wings of the building instead of individual units, but because of the way the things are constructed, and so. You know, those are also part of the question to have. Do you do classroom units with the mini splits, which is very popular right now happening in schools, or do you do, you know, the much larger um, units that, you know, are, are ducked over multiple rooms? Um, and so, and, and I believe they're leaning toward, the, on some of the spaces at Deerfield that you're going to have to do ducked over multiple rooms. Word have to is, you know, what you're going to want to do to be cost effective is going to have to be looking at that way. But anyway, that is still premature because I haven't seen their full report, but that's what they're mm -hmm. discussing as well. So anyway, interesting. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, any questions, anyone? Not seeing any. Um, summer programs update? Is that Tina? Or? That's me. Yep. So we were kind of buzzing this summer with um, over 90 students that participated in academic learning, social, emotional, and preschool camps. And so we want to just give a big heartfelt thank you to all those educators who made summer learning joyful and positive and successful. They expertly guided a lot of deep discussions. They valued everyone's voice and they accomplished amazing work. 
we also had River Valley Day Camp here as well. So we were kind of um, hopping this summer. Okay. That's okay. So the 90 students, were they, could you talk a little bit more about the learning programs? Yeah, so we had um, an academic learning camp. We had Waitley students and Deerfield students that participated in um, some like game-based learning around math and um, ELA. It was a four-week program. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, <clears throat> Any other questions, folks? Not hearing any personnel update. We welcomed a lot of new staff this year. So we have over nine new teachers, including long-term subs, about 11 instructional assistants. And we have um, many teachers that have changed positions at Deerfield. So, we have a fifth grade teacher that moved into the library media specialist position, and we've had um, a teacher move from first grade to kindergarten and um, IAs that kind of moved up to teaching positions. So um, we're moving, we're moving kind of right along here. I'm good. <clears throat> so. Okay. Um, we have next on the agenda, MOU. DESI, DCF discussion only. <laughs> yeah, we're actually going to ask for a vote, even though it says discussion only. It's a vote of your support um, to enter into an MOU uh, with DESI, DCF, and then Executive Office of Health and Human Services. So I forwarded yeah. this document. Donna had it in the packet. So we basically what it says is that um, if we have any students that are covered under the title 4E in foster care, um, the school will do the right reporting that is necessary to submit for reimbursement for transportation costs. Um, because under the Every Student Succeeds Act, we are required to pay for transportation if we are the origin school for a student who right. is considered to be in foster care or a homeless student. So. Um, I don't expect that this would come up often, but I did discover last year when doing some looking around because we had it come up at another school in our district that um, we had to pay for transportation that was unbudgeted. So I did discover that this MOU exists and that we can request reimbursement. It's not 100% reimbursement, um, and it is something that you know varies school by school, year by year. So um, it may or may not be something that Deerfield can... Um, capture for additional funds for transportation funding, but we may as well have it in place. So the select board actually has to accept this MOU because the school falls under the town. It's not its own entity. Um, they could appoint Darius to sign if they would like to, or they can, assi they can sign it themselves. So we're looking for your support to take this to the select board to ask them to accept this MOU and sign off on it. Okay, well, that now I have a better explanation as to what what the MOU was for. <clears throat> um, I have a, a question, just a clarifying question. Um, so, except I'm just sort of wondering, like, how is this in terms of transportation of of a student who lives outside? lives off of the bus lines or something or you know like isn't able to take the regular bus routes or or how does it actually it, you know hypothetically how would this actually apply as far as what costs we would um you know what we would be be trying to provide in terms of yeah services. so if there's a student in Deerfield district that is placed whether that's considered homeless or foster care in another town um, they can continue to go to school in their home district. So we're paying for transportation from where they reside as a foster care child or a homeless student and bringing them back into district so that they don't have to get displaced from their school and their previous home at the same time. Um, and typically the other town that they're residing in will split the cost of transportation with us. There has to be an agreement to make that happen. Um, but it is typically an unbudgeted expense because we never know when it's going to come up or how frequently it's going to come up. 
So it's nice to be able to have some type of reimbursement available. Thank you. Well, I can't see, or I couldn't think of a reason to not support this. I, I would be inclined. Did you want a straw poll vote, a formal vote? or? Um, yeah, so we, we basically met with all the town administrators and told them about this and said, hey, can you bring this to your select boards? And they said, you know what, can you get it endorsed by the school committee? It gives a little more weight and then right. it'll move more quickly. So just that you you recommend sending it to the town, you recommend sending it to the select board and just do a quick vote on that. Okay. So um, I have a question, Shelly, is, is this um, a new MOU or is this been around? since since they started doing this yeah it's been around a long time just our no one in our district has ever participated in it um we don't have this come up very often so it's probably something that wasn't necessarily worth all the efforts in the past but i'd like to have it in place right i think it makes sense to have it in place it's it's been my experience that it's unfunded um so it's supposed to be split between the school district and DCF. And when I first pursued that, that's all fine and well, except DCF does not have a line item for transportation, <laughs> so they can't do it. But um, I think it makes sense to have it in place in case that ever changes, and perhaps it will. It seems to, uh, from the sounds of it, Mary, it seems to fall in line with most of the uh, transportation funding <laughs> <laughs> that's promised. So. That's right. Um, but I, I think from my perspective, it's, it's certainly a, a, a precaution or a, a step that's worth taking just to have it in place if and, if and or when it's uh, needed or necessary and see if we can get some funds. So I would, uh, I would entertain a motion to recommend sending the uh, MO, member of, memorandum of understanding with Desi on the uh, DCF transportation, or DESI and DCF on uh, transportation to the select board. So moved. I have, oh, I'll second. Who was that? I wasn't looking. Was that Carrie or Erica? Erica, was it? Erica seconding. Yeah, second. Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion? Not seeing any. Uh, we will do a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Um, David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. <clears throat> Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. Very good. It's unanimous, 5-0. Thank you for bringing it to us, Shelley. And we'll see what the select board does. <clears throat> um, Revised uh, policy BEDH public comment at school committee meetings. Oh, he looks like he's talking to someone. I have a guest in my office. Ah. Robert Hall is over here because he's having technology problems. He's got a meeting after this. So anyway, oh, there you jump go. back in here and then, then help him. Um, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, the public comment, yes. Public comment. <laughs> the public comment. Uh, comment on that? Um, <laughs> so I think, so basically what, you know, we had a, uh, uh, you know, a very difficult meeting at our last, um, at our last joint meeting, um, not only in content, not only in um, some of the uh, remarks that were made by the public, um, but also just a very, a very stressful um, meeting. And then we also had, um, written comment that was read and lots of it. Um, and when, after discussing with the attorney, um, actually prior to the meeting, he recommended that we don't read public comment. He said the public can write into the school committee, the school committee can read it, ingest it, and, and help formulate their opinions on subjects. And that us reading other people's words out loud is not a good practice uh, for multiple reasons. One, it can be misconstrued as your your words or whoever's reading its words. Um, two, if there's a violation of any policies, um, you know, such as, uh, you know, if someone's not following our open meeting, law, open meeting, not open meeting, our um, 
public comment policy and saying something, calling out a, a community member or a staff member, you know, something like that, or just being plain rude or that kind of thing. Um, and then we started editing their comments in order to fit. Then you get into censorship of someone's comments and then, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then third, um, you know, we also had problems with it that some people's written comments were longer than the two minutes. And so written comments actually had a longer voice than the people who showed up in person to speak. And so there's a lot of different complications there. And he said that it's not as, the way our past policy was written, it was not, it didn't state that we would be reading them during, um, the original one rather, so that we wouldn't be reading them during. And then we kind of modified it that we would do it during COVID to try to get greater participation. And so um, no good deed goes unpunished there as you try to get greater thing. So. What we're trying to say now is that we're going to roll back what I'm proposing, you say, and it's been run by the attorney who's gone through this, um, is that we no longer read public comment during um, public comment. Um, we can acknowledge that we received letters. Um, the chair could make exceptions if someone is, there's a, a disability or some, you know, you know, some circumstances, you know, a, a slow public comment night. But when you're having a full, long debate, and this is a business meeting. I try to. I said that in the last meeting. I also say for people watching it, a school meeting is a business meeting. You have a portion for public comment, and you have a portion you have to do business. And so, um, you know, restricting public the amount of public comment is sometimes necessary um, in order to do business. So, um, so anyways, if you want to vote that this evening, um, hey, I leave it up to you to have a discussion. We probably should have a discussion first. Um, I also wanted the committee to talk a little bit about. Um, you know, that there were comments made at the last meeting that were insensitive to um, groups in our community. And um, next some strong straight out profanity was said in the meeting. And there was no real, I want to talk a little bit with the committee about what we're supposed to do during that time. And I think there was, um, while it was brought up and addressed to some capacity in the meeting, um, it could have been brought up faster. It could have, you know, and how do we deal with those kind of things? It's very it was a very stressful meeting on people, and um, I want to recognize that, and I am not certainly don't want to be finger-pointing at anyone um, within that, but I, I want to talk a little bit about what do you do as a school committee member on that um, as well. And so we can talk about that now, or we can talk about that afterwards, but um, I just want to talk a little bit about that as well, just to, to help people out and help my, myself out, because I certainly could have done more as well. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, how do you want to proceed there? <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Darius. Uh, I did think about that after the meeting. I wish I had said more. Um, but it, it, part of it was, it was a school committee meeting, but it's also a board of health meeting. That it, there wasn't one one body or one person in charge of it. Um, so I can see that being uh, hard to navigate in the moment. You know, who's, whose responsibility is to speak up when something kind of egregious like that happens? Um, but it, 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 it's good, worth having this discussion and kind of like get our get a plan for going forward if something like that happens again. So oh, awesome. wait, let's go down the road. I, I think the with the normal course of practice within you know our parliamentary procedures is that um, or Robert's rules, not parliamentary procedures, Robert rules, um, is that basically you would call a any board, any member of the committee would say to the chair a point of order because our policy was being violated. And it should be addressed to the chair. So if Tina is saying something, calling the superintendent something, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, one of you would always say, one of you would say, Mr. Ch you know, Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, who is chair, um, a point of order, this, you know, the comments here are not addressing, and then you would you, you address your comments through the chair. Cause I think it we have to support one another. It's not an easy position. These aren't easy times to be school committee members. Um, you may have seen in the news certain school committee members are leaving the positions because of the amount of stress that this has caused on and we come on some of the ugliness that's come of it. Um, and we need to support each other in that. And so part of that of doing that is you, know, you can call a point of order to ask for clarification. Are we going to allow? I've noticed that that you said two minutes per person, and that person's been allowed to go on for seven minutes now. You know, meanwhile, that person's the neighbor, and you know, the, the, Ken, I was talking about a chair, but I'm talking about all chairs, so I'm not so right. meant to recommend anything to you. Um, but you know, sometimes the chair needs help, you know, that kind of stuff, or is so caught up in thinking about the last comment or what to do next that sometimes you know it gets becomes overwhelming. I've been there, I've been a chair before, um, when I was on school committee, and it's it's difficult to do, it's difficult to run a meeting, think about what you want to say, mm -hmm. and you know, try to make sure everybody's heard. So mm -hmm. that's that's the easiest way, but. Talking about, we don't really, we don't have trainings 
as a full group where we talk about what do we do. And for years, we didn't, you know, we had one or two people comment. And maybe we went stretches where we didn't see anybody for months. You know what I mean? So right. it's kind of a new kind of thing. And it's new skills and new kind of, uh, you know, many times what policy is written for. It's not written for when one person shows up and says, you know, I want to talk about blank. It's not on the agenda. And we let it happen anyways, because there's no no harm, no foul. Um, and the chair has that discretion. Anyways, I over talked there. So please jump in, people. Okay. If well, I may. I, oh, go ahead. Uh, just just a couple of quick things, uh, just two things, actually. Um, the one thing I notice is that this policy talks about three minutes. We limited it to two minutes at the um, the last meeting. Um, so I'm wondering what we'd want to do as a committee, two or three minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, couldn't so, but if you did number one, so sorry, I spoke too much. Go ahead, David. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I don't know how rigid you need to be in right. policy. I mean, depending on what the issue is that everybody is all up in arms about, it seems like the chair could set that time limit at the beginning of the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, is another way to approach it. Sure. I mean, if you have six people who want to speak, maybe three minutes is okay. If the room is full of, you know, 20, 30 people, then maybe it's two minutes. Right. I mean, I, I don't know whether we need to be rigid in the policy is what I'm suggesting. Maybe it can be. Yeah. Right. Rigid. And number one does talk about the chair shall determine the length of public participation segment. Okay. And so in order to allow, you know, we don't really do it that way. Instead, we limit the number of people because we want to hear everybody's. And I understand you're in a weird spot. <laughs> it, 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 that's where people have to also understand the chair is a weird spot. You're putting these rules down and your job is to hear what people have to say, but at the same time, you know, well, you also have business to conduct. Right. I, I mean, my, as many of you know, my policy or my approach over the years is to, has been to let public comment sort of happen organically and uh, take its course because most of the time we haven't had a large contingent of people looking to speak. Um, it's only in the last 18 months or so that we've really wrestled with the fact that we have so many people uh, trying to speak all at once and and I I tend to not hold people to hold people's feet to the fire in terms of two or three minutes if it's uh, as long as it's not being repetitious and droning on forever uh, I let, like to let people speak so I guess the, the language that we have is fine the way it's written um, but I just wanted to bring it up point out that it was three versus the two. <clears throat> so, um, Erica? All right, if I chime yes, in. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Erica. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I was, uh, well, I have one actual, like, copy editing thing and then another comment, which was then in the second paragraph, um, the right before the second strikeout, it looks like it needs to say, may request a meeting invite via email or postal mail or some other phrasing to refer to postal mail um, because the next sentence says mailing address and email address will be provided on the posting notice. And so it only says email at the beginning and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it looks like there's something missing in that when you so remove the strikeout. You know, you bring up a good question, Erica, because that was actually what was asked at the Waitley meeting about. Oh, you know, just about this? it's a good question. But the, the the issue is that that people can still give public comment to you in writing. We're just not going to read it. And you could also ask that it be it could also be part of the public record as well. So we're going to give where they can send you comments and email you comments for you to, to digest without. Right. And uh, what I'm just, it's just a matter, it's just a, it's just a, a typo kind of thing in that it refers to speaking. If a member of the public who would like to speak during public comment may request a meeting invite via email. And then it talks about mailing address and email address will be provided on the posting. So there is, it, it, are you only able to request to speak 
via email or can you also send a letter through snail mail to ask to speak? We could, okay. but I don't think anybody's okay. ever done it that way. Okay, I just then then I was just wondering why it says mailing address will be provided. I, I think if that's the, the mail in your written comments. I think I, I think it's more to be fair. <clears throat> Whereas the email address is to get you uh, allowed to speak in person at the meeting. Okay. Um, oops, my page just it's zoomed off. It's, <laughs> it's just not clear to me how that. Carrie, um, Carrie, looks so like you were couldn't hear you. Uh -huh. Sorry, Erica. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying I can see Erica's point that the mailing address follows immediately the requesting via by by via email. It's almost like the mailing address, the email address will be provided in the post you notice. Know, sentence should come at the end after the number eight written comments may be submitted. Um, just you know, needs right, to be somewhere this, here. I agree, but it is. I can see how it would be confusing immediately after. Yeah, because yeah, you struck out public comments may be submitted in writing to the chair. <clears throat> so there's nothing in that paragraph that refers to before the, anyway. Yeah, why was that struck out, by the way? I didn't understand that, since we're still allowing public comments to be submitted. I thought it was written down at the bottom. Um, yeah, it was again. I think. I mean, it's it's in the it's in the uh, you know one through eight down below. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I certainly think it's a great policy not to read the comments. I mean, the expectation is we've read mm -hmm. them before the meeting. We've taken them into account. We don't need to read them so other people. The purpose of the right. meeting is not for the public to know what the other public is thinking. Right. And sorry, that was one of my, but David, are you, I didn't want to cut in on you. Are you? No, I'm done. Sorry. I okay. cut in on you. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, I was just going to also just chime in in general to Darius's question about what we think about it. Um, and I think that the amount of time, you know, is like you're saying, you know, we can, we can play that by ear. And I think that from, from my, one of the things that I was um, sort of grappling with before and during the meeting was how does, how, as Darius was asking, how do we respond um, to comments that are offensive um, and hurtful? Um, and while, you know, without stepping on people's right to free, you know, First Amendment rights to free speech, at the same time, it seems like you know, do we have, um, I mean, it, it, one thing that Dar Darius just mentioned actually is the idea of, you know, if we don't have training in how to, um, you know, conduct public comment, then perhaps it's something that we as a committee should do is learn how to weather those things because, you know, they may happen again, may, may happen a lot again. Um, and then just also, I think that one of the things about, you know, the the sort of, and this is something that I had sort of thought definitely in the moment is that one of the dangers of not ants uh, responding when someone when someone presents a um, a hurtful or offensive comment is that it, the silence, even though you know, it, I understand the idea that you know if we, and again, this is not being directed to you know. This is just sort of a general comment about procedures. Um, is that taking a stance of of saying that we are letting everyone have their moment to speak without evaluating it or checking someone if they're saying something hurtful means that it kind of gives the equal weight to that statement, along with other other statements that may or may not. Um, you know, that might be said politely and, um, you know, such. So, so it's just a matter of, uh, you know, I, I think that it would be, and it also shows support for the members of the community for whom those statements were hurtful or offensive. So I, I think that there is a role that we could play as, um, you know, leaders in our community to try 
to find a way to do that in a way that um, respects everyone's ability to have a voice, but also sets some values or standards for how we conduct ourselves in public with each other. So it's, well, it's, it's certainly a, a, a tight rope to walk. Um, and there aren't many times in the 25 or 30 plus years that I've been chairing meetings that I've had to, you know, say to someone enough is enough. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do in hindsight regret not, not responding more forcefully. Um, thank you to, you know, the committee members that did, uh, to the comments that were made last meeting. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, as a general rule, it, it's, it's difficult. Something that may be hurtful to some people may not be, I, I you know, it, it's something for me that's difficult to, to pick the moments when I, I, I have to say, excuse me, you know, that's, that's out of line and the chair's prerogative to, you know, cut off your comments at this point in time. It's, uh, so I don't know. <laughs> well, and don't, I mean, people did call out the comments. Yes. Um, so that, no, I think absolutely. That a, you know, it's a good thing. We're never going to be able to control, it, uh, you know, what comes out of some people's mouths in the moment it comes out. Right. Mm -hmm. and it's public That's comment. correct. I mean, it's, obviously you're allowed to interrupt and shut them off when they're starting to um, talk about personnel in the schools, right? Or direct complaints about individuals. That's just a, that's sort of a mm -hmm. policy thing. It, you know, it's not even a judgment call, really. That's just, we're not going to listen to that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, that's, um, it's, not, it's certainly not, not an easy tightrope, as you say, to walk. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think the <clears throat> the policy as it's as it's been revised and presented here, um, I think is. Mary has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was just wondering about. I mean, I think we can tolerate perspectives of other people, and I think it's more in what we tolerate in the delivery and the words chosen. But Correct. Because when you add all the emotion and the inappropriate words it makes it hard to listen to anybody's perspective but i was wondering about just having an opening comment to um, public comment about our general as a committee our general expectations of people's behavior when they're when they're making public comment i mean there was even some valid points i think um, with people who didn't necessarily use bad language but were just put a lot of emotion into it and I think there were some valid points, but I think they would have been understood better if they were presented differently. Mm -hmm. so I, I just thought about putting out as a committee our expectation of public comment. Certainly. Kind of like I, code of conduct or something. Right. Like they do at sporting events. I mean, you're told now, you know, what's okay and what's not. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly if, if, we have guests that are going to speak. It would be easy for me to to take some of the language from this, you know, from the policy and, and emphasize it. Um, you know, specifically emphasize the. Uh, oops, I keep going to the wrong one. Um, <clears throat> you know, specifically number four, and um, and and that's really where we're. You know mm -hmm. <clears throat> what we're that what we're leaning towards and and talking about most here, um, <clears throat> and you know four and six mm -hmm. could be read and uh, emphasized to people before before we start the public comment section. So, no, it's I, just um, just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna. Um, sort of a follow-up comment that, um, you know, yes, it's true that so people's opinions will differ. And, you know, uh, and we obviously we've seen the example of polar opposites in that. Um, and that, you know, but the thing is that when it's, um, you know, if somebody's, uh, if a hurtful comment is made, and I think that it, it is, um, 
it is important to acknowledge that 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 is a hurtful comment for someone in the community like if it hurts anyone it should be something that we want to avoid i guess i mean i i can't think of an instance where something can be said that is hurtful to someone that is actually positive to someone else and maybe you know maybe there are examples but um you know or uplifting to someone else i suppose um but i guess it's just that i would just be you know, I just say that, you know, maybe it's a, a level of awareness raising of knowing, you know, and that's something I do on a daily basis is try to understand more about all the people in my community and what what is um, what to be sensitive about. And so I think that in that case, then, you know, if we're trying to look out for our community and make people feel like they belong, that it is important to, to stand up for them. But, you know, it's a huge it's a huge issue and a huge thing. And that's why we have the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee to work on figuring these things out and figuring a way to be be, be good to each other. So yes. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, any other thoughts from people? I want to go back to Mary's point. Um, I like the idea of a kind of stating an expected code of comment. Um, and I totally agree, Mary, that when someone um, is angry, it's harder to hear what they're saying. But I don't know how we get into uh, telling people how to speak at a meeting. If you, you know, when you're starting to to tell someone they can't get upset, um, I just don't phrase it in a way that's that's not harmful to people. You know, you, you can't tell someone they can't be upset about something. Where who decides what's the appropriate level of emotion to have? Um, and that wasn't my that wasn't my so intent we to control wasn't my intent to control oh, it, I know, but I know. I just, just to put out the expectation you know of course people are going to always have different issues and show emotion but i think if we right. put out the request it might be helpful yeah i think i, I think the language think in the in the that. um policy is pretty good I, in terms of just making a quick statement at the start of public comment each time, if I can remember to do it, is to say- you cannot, I, can, I can prepare that. I can prepare that for you. Okay. Uh, what you can do with statement right. before public comment. Um, yeah. And then we just have it <clears throat> and it makes it easy. Easier. <laughs> or it should make it clearer. So um, what do people want to do? Do we want to- uh, Vote the revised policy. Do you have suggested language change? Do you want to have email in mailing addresses? Uh, what I'm, I'm open what, here. Is this a policy for the district or just for our school? Because if it's one of these policies, it's going around to all of the various towns, and I don't know that we want to so, tinker too much with the language. To yeah, so right. I can change the language in that paragraph and edit so it's more clear. The content okay. change that you're voting on. So you're kind of giving me the leeway to you know make sure it's readable. And I can add that you know, the mailing and the email address will be provided for written comment to the committee on the posted notice for each meeting. So I'll change okay. the language there. You don't have to worry about voting that into the record because the, okay. real, the real substance change is that you're not reading. Um, you're not reading public comments um, at the meetings. They can be read by the people who want to read. They can read their own. You know, that, that's certainly allowed. Um, that question came up. And um, you're going to need, if you want to vote that tonight, you need to waive, you need the first vote to waive your two reading policy. Because any policy right. you have now, you do a double reading. In order for this to be effective for next month, um, you want to first waive your double reading policy. You vote that, and then you vote this policy. So waive the reading policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because <clears throat> you're, break, you're, break, you're, you're, you're breaking your own rules, but you're voting to break your rules because you don't want to wait three months to get this thing into this thing running. You want this to be at the next meeting. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because <laughs> it could be an October meeting, and it, quite frankly, right. could be um, so, a, a rehash of some of the stuff we talked about in August. So I would entertain a motion to waive the two month reading policy. <clears throat> On a policy. 
So moved. So moved. Second. C D second. Okay. Any discussion on waiving the need to uh, have two months of I mean a discussion this month and then a vote next month? I don't see any, so we'll do a roll call. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchels. Yes. Okay. Uh, Erica Jacob. Yes. And Mary Raymond. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, now I would entertain a motion to approve uh, revised policy BEDH um, dated. Got it here somewhere. I uh, know. Oh, it would be revised uh, today. Today. Uh, revised August, I mean, September, <laughs> September 14th, 2021. Do we have a motion? So moved. I make the motion. Carry motion. Anyone second? I'll second, second. it. Any further discussion? Um, hearing none, uh, we will go to a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Uh, David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchels? Yes. <laughs> Erica Jacob? Yes. And Mary Raymond? Yes. Thank you all very much. Uh, We'll move on the agenda to MASC MASS Joint Conference designation of an official delegate. Um, so now, both Erica, both Erica and Carrie are going. One yes. of them needs to be your official voter at the meeting. So does one of them want to volunteer to be it? <laughs> Stone, paper, scissor. Right now, let's see it. <laughs> I, yeah, I was thinking I'd do rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I but go for it, Carrie. I'll be the backup or whatever, right? There's a backup okay. there. Well, alternate. So do I? Do we have to vote it, Darius, or can I just appoint? You can just. I think you can just appoint. Just appoint. We'll we'll They're appoint not Carrie. After, not coming after us. Carrie, Carrie Etchells is our designated <clears throat> official delegate. I mean, as our official delegate, and uh, Erica as. The alternate should something happen that Carrie doesn't attend. Very good. And are you both going down or are you participating virtually? I believe in person. I'm going. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for doing that. It's a it's a, a different it's an education, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, thank you. All right. Um, reports. Committee chair has nothing. The collaborative. Is any news? Are we all set on the collaborative yeah, side? Uh, nothing has happened yet. Okay. Well, that's, mind, so. that's fine. Uh, Tina, principal. I do have two more things that we didn't discuss throughout the meeting. And did you, were you going to say something, Ken? No. Okay. So one of them is just, I want to recognize and share that out of a highly competitive pool of candidates, Jillian Andrews has been selected to represent Massachusetts as an NEA Global Fellow. It's a year long professional learning experience focused on educating and empowering students and global citizens. And it culminates in a nine day international um, field study to South Africa. So congratulations, Jillian. She's on here. Seriously. Yes, that's a, amazing. It's a huge accomplishment. And she's she's representing Massachusetts and she's from right here in Deerfield. So that's awesome. All right. And then you guys are probably sick of hearing from me. So I have two members of the ILT that would like to give you an update. And we have Jillian Andrews and Kristen Robinson. Okay. 
Go right ahead, Jillian and Christy. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I, we've got our first meeting tonight. So we, I sn I'm sneaking in here right in the nick of time. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much you remember about what we have spoken about a little bit before. Previously, we've told the school committee a little bit about what's called an ILT, which is Instructional Leadership Team. And we have just. Um, gathered a few more members on our team, which we're super excited about. Uh, Mary McFarland, who teaches third grade, and Jennifer Smith, who teaches fourth grade, will be joining us. So we're really trying to work towards building an ILT that has a larger representation rather than just the, the four of us of who, who was there earlier. So we're excited about that. Um, this summer, uh, Kristen, Meg, and I took some um, really exciting professional development and learned a lot more about how instructional leadership teams work. And so this year we're, we're launching a whole new way of looking at um, the work that we're trying to do. And so one of the things that we've done is we began our year by meeting with new teachers. So new to us teachers who are brand new coming into the district and then um, also working with some new teachers who may have been in the school for a year or two, um, but we're, we're really doing this onboarding where we are, um, which we haven't really done too much of, if at all, in the past. We're really trying to onboard new teachers so that it's not just about the mentorship program where we're giving them sort of the logistics of the school um, and how to fill out forms and where to look for things. We're really trying to onboard them in terms of making them feel welcome and familiarize them with the curricula. Um, another thing that we did a lot of research on and looked at this summer was coaching. And so we have started, we're starting a student-centered coaching model. And um, really schools across the country, you can go to many, many different districts and see that many schools across the world actually have coaches as part of their staff. So the ILT is looking at this coaching model and it's very student centered so that we can work with new teachers um, to start with and work with them on instructional practices. And um, the goal really is to, to not just lift the, the, um, the school community in terms of students and their level of learning, but to also grow as, as learners ourselves, as teachers. And that actually includes not just new teachers, but we're hoping for full participation of the staff with time. And also just as an instructional leadership team, it's a huge opportunity for us also to be growing and learning and thinking about our own instructional practices and how we can come together in what's called PLCs. There's a lot of lingo here, but that stands for professional learning communities, um, where we're working together to be looking at our, our practices, looking at students' work, which is really the foundation of the work that we're doing, is to be looking at student work, assessing student work, thinking about where the deficits are, where the strengths are, and working with each other in a collaborative way so that we can improve our instruction and work towards better student outcomes. So um, the cycle, the coaching cycle is beginning very soon, September 29th. We're, we're sort of jumping right in there. And we're really excited about it. Um, so that's one thing that the ILT is doing, the instructional leadership team is doing. The next thing that we're doing is we're planning an afternoon of building-based, if you've seen the professional development plan for the year, there are some building-based professional development opportunities. So um, we are going to be doing something we've never done in the school um, and that we're really excited about. And Kristen and I will be leading a, um, an afternoon of writing data calibration. And that's gonna kick off our first school-based professional development. So just so that you, you can, you might be able to figure out what it is just by the title of it, the, it's, a, it's a calibration. So one of the things that happens when we're looking at student work, whether it's writing or math or reading, but in particular with writing, it's very subjective. And so you can imagine if I gave you all a piece of student work right now, if I gave you a fifth grade piece of writing or a first grade piece of writing and I asked you, okay, here's the rubric, go ahead and score it, um, there, there would be huge levels of subjectivity. So Carrie might score it as one thing and Ken might score it as another thing and Erica might score it as another thing. 
So the calibration process, there's a protocol for it. So we're going to be coming together. We're all going to be looking at one student, one piece of student writing, and we're going to be using a rubric that we have to score it and calibrate it. It's a pretty, for those of us who are teaching geeks, it's really exciting. It's a lot of fun. Um, sometimes we get into these big debates about scoring, um, but what it does is it gets us into sort of the granular parts of scoring and the granular parts of looking at what constitutes um, what constitutes where students are meeting the standards. Um, so we've never really done this as a district, so we're, we're really excited. Kristen and I have done it in other districts before as professional development, and we are really excited to bring this to our school. Um, so that's, that's that part. And um, again, that focus on language arts is going to be continuing in our data meetings um, throughout the year so that we're really running this thread throughout the year. Um, oftentimes with, with teachers, we are pulled in a hundred different directions. And so we're really trying to streamline our work so that our data meetings, our coaching, our professional, our building-based professional development has a common thread to it so that we're not, you know, one day it's math and one day it's it's this and one day it's that. We're really trying to have some consistency and some, some in-depth work so that we can um, really increase the, the, um, the levels of student, student writing um, in particular this year. And I do want to say one of the things that we learned from this summer's professional development is based on the data that that they've been collecting, um, that one particular organization called Visible Learning is collecting is on student writing. And that is where they're seeing the hugest deficit across the, the world, across, in England, in Australia, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe. They're seeing that based on the data after, you know, over a year of COVID learning, of, of remote learning, of, um, you know, of all of this pivoting, um, they're seeing the hugest deficits actually in writing. So we're excited to take this on and um, Kristen will follow up. Um, and then if there are any questions, we're happy to, to answer those. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah, we're also super excited that our RTI groups are up and running. RTI stands for Response to Intervention. And these interventions are happening starting in kindergarten all the way through third grade. Every six weeks, each grade level team and interventionist and SPED liaisons will meet to discuss students' progress and create new intervention groups and create new goals for each group. This typically happens, we have about five rounds of RTI each year and we keep a database to kind of log all, log and track all of every student's interventions and how many uh, rounds they've had. So that's pretty typical for our year. And that's all we have to share this evening. Are there any questions? Be good. I I don't see any uh, any questions. Uh, thank you for the very precise and concise update. And the work you're doing is amazing. <laughs> it's quite a team. You, you, it's nice that you've got a bigger team this year to help you. <laughs> so very good. Thank you. I'll just I'll just say um, yeah. Thank you. It all sounds really great. And congratulations, Julianne, for. Uh, yes. for that award. It's great. Mm -hmm. So, Darius, I know you sent your report. Yep. Uh, really quickly, I sent you guys a report. The only thing I want to say kind of that's in the report that wasn't talked about is that, you know, right now we are down a bus at Deerfield Elementary, and I think it was in Tina's report as well, um, due to lack of drivers that, um, that Gripco can find. As you may have saw, the governor today deploy the National Guard to be bus drivers across the state. Um, it's that much of a problem that there, there's just no applicants or people out there. So as soon as he, or Gripco Transportation, rather than one person, um, get another driver, we'll add the fourth route. Right now we're doing a combined route. So we have more longer bus routes and um, more students on the bus, um, but they're really, they're without options right now because they have what they have. And um, so, Right now, financially, they are motivated to do so because their um, their contract says they have, right. they're paying us back money for that fourth bus until they can um, feel that. So um, I just want to put it out there. If anybody's watching, is like, gosh, I 
I want to join the National Guard and drive a bus. Now's your opportunity. No, if you want to uh, become a bus driver, that kind of stuff, um, you know, send a note to either me or the Public Transportation, and they will process your application. Okay. Uh, and we're in better shape than most districts around us that can't find drivers at all and didn't know what to do about opening school. So mm -hmm. we're lucky that they're able to figure something out at this point. Great. So does anyone else have anything? Um, if not, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. And a second. Second. Uh, not open for debate. <laughs> so uh, we'll let's start the button. Mary Raymond, roll call vote. Yes. Mary, yes. Eric, Erica, yes. Carrie, yes. Yeah. And David, yes. And Ken Cutterback, yes. We are officially adjourned at six fifty-five p.m. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening, and we'll see you in a month. <laughs>